accepted the products of science. We rejected its methods. Maybe the reptiles will evolve intelligence once more. Perhaps one day, there will be civilizations again on Earth. There will be life. There will be intelligence. But there will be no more humans. Not here, not on a billion worlds. Hey folks, you're listening to All Aboard the Dream Train, a dream storytelling podcast where stories and experiences created by the unconscious brain are retold by the waking brain. A place where we explore the similarities, differences, and connections between the dreaming life and the waking life. All right, folks, welcome back and thanks again for listening. This is the last episode for 2019, and I just want to say once more, uh, thanks again for all your support, and thanks to all the guests for sharing their stories. The clip you heard at the beginning of the episode was none other than astronomer Carl Sagan, the host of the 13-part epic television series, The Cosmos. In this clip, Carl tells us about a dream he had about human extinction due to nuclear war. Luckily for us, that hasn't happened yet, but what if it had come true? Let's say you have a dream, and in that dream, you learn about an event that's going to happen in the future, or you receive a piece of information that could be significant in the future. What do you do with that information? And can you or should you take it seriously? In today's episode, we explore precognitive dreams. The Merriam-Webster definition of precognition is the clairvoyance relating to an event or state not yet experienced. I've been super excited to release today's episode, and it's a great honor to introduce today's guest. He's a faculty member in the astronomy department at the University of California, Berkeley, and affiliated with the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California, and also the Institute of Astrophysics in Hercleo Crete. He's the author of The Oneronauts, or Dream Travelers a book that explores using dreams to engineer our future. It's fascinating to hear his thoughts, and I could probably listen to him talk all day. Please welcome aboard, Dr. Paul Callis. Yeah, uh, my name is Paul Callis. I'm in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area. I'm a professor of astronomy at the University of California, Berkeley, so actually, I'm an astronomer. That's my job. I look at the uh, night sky. I, uh, my specialty is actually trying to find planets around other stars. They're called extrasolar planets. I use uh, some of the largest telescopes we've got on the planet. I also use the Hubble Space Telescope. And at the same time, I wrote a book uh, about my dreams. <laughs> cool. Can you hit on some of your hobbies and your passions real quick? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, well, astronomy was actually my hobby uh, as a high schooler. So all those people out there uh, with a telescope in their backyard, that's thats how I started out. Hmm. Um, I've always been interested in um, uh, science, but also arts. So uh, I was a photographer for a while, like high school photography and such. Uh, um, I was uh, a guitar. I play classical guitar as well. Um, I've been swimming all my life and uh, staying healthy. And uh, I, I often wonder if to have uh, really interesting dreams, uh, it's good to you know be as healthy as possible, mm-hmm. good cardiovascular health. So uh, you know, I got a wide range. I love to travel, um, and uh, I love to uh, think about dreams as well. Very cool. Um, what helps you relax or unwind when you're not, uh, I guess, at work or doing research? 
That's actually a really good question. Something I've been thinking about. What's the best way to relax and unwind so you can have like a good night's sleep? Mm -hmm. Usually I'll try to see something uh, creative or do something that is uh, stimulating creatively, like read a book or just even watch TV. Uh, I haven't found the perfect uh, the perfect formula, though. And I really wish I could just tell you, do these three things, and you're going to have an amazing night sleeping. But I yeah. can't. We do what we can, right? Yeah. Do you keep a dream journal? Uh, I do. So, I mean, that's really the key to um, this whole uh, outcome that I wrote a book on precognitive dreams. So the idea is to pay attention to your dreams and write them down. And I have um, pretty comprehensive dream journals. Um, and it's hard to write down all of your dreams. Uh, I have to admit, uh, at least I remember them. Not everybody can remember them. So I'll write down my dreams. Uh, now, because I don't have that much time, I'll actually focus on the dreams I think could come true in the future. Hmm. Um, so dreams are uh, about your own psychology, about trying to process memories of things you saw during the day. Uh, those are normal dreams. Um, some are obviously sort of uh, cannot possibly happen. So if it's a dream that I'm flying through the Amazon rainforest, I don't think that's going to happen. So I won't write it down, actually. Mm. Uh, but if it's something from the f that's, that seems unusual, surprising, uh, novel, um, a new learning experience, a puzzle... I will focus on those dreams and write them down. Yeah. Things you can maybe work with in the future. Right. Uh, so I'll write them down uh, as just plain text. Um, if you really want to do a great job, you can do video logs. Uh, uh, Ian Wilson, who's a, a well-known lucid dreamer, yeah. he posts his uh, videos online. Yeah, it's funny. I just uh, kind of was introduced to Ian. Um, so I've seen a couple of his videos. They're awesome. Yeah, that's a really solid way to do it because when you post it on YouTube or on Facebook or whatever, you're sort of time stamping your dream. Uh, it's hard to, to fake it uh, if later you say that was precognitive because there's a record online that you had this dream uh, last Tuesday, uh, but then three weeks later, something actually happens that matches the dream exactly. That's a good point. Very good point. What's your sleep schedule like? Do you are you very like go to bed at eight, wake up at a certain time? Yeah, I'm a I'm a night owl, as you might expect from an astronomer. <laughs> uh, in fact, our work starts at sunset and it finishes oh. at sunrise. Wow. Uh, yeah. So when when we're actually at a telescope, so I'm uh, in general I can't really go to sleep early. Yeah. I, would, I would say I sleep around uh, eleven or midnight. Uh, definitely a night owl. Uh, but that doesn't mean I wake up late because then you have to wake up anyway. So uh, I actually really like taking a nap sometime during the day. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you got to get those naps in. Do you track your sleep at all, Paul? Um, yeah. for uh, Actually, for my book, I wore uh, for several years. I wanted to see what my sleep was like mm -hmm. uh, so I could quantify it. So there would be a measurement of my um, sleep. And I use something called the Zio headband. And uh, that actually went out of business, but uh, I think there are going to be other types of headbands that replace it. So this isn't the type of sleep tracker that just monitors uh, your motion or your pulse. What it is, it's actually like a, a EEG. It's measuring your brain waves hmm. through the night and interpreting the waves uh, uh, according to the, the four stages of sleep. And then it shows you a report at, um, at the end of the night. It shows how much uh, uh, light sleep you had, how much deep sleep you had, how many times you woke up, and uh, how many times, uh, how long was your period of um, REM or rapid, rapid eye movement, mm -hmm. um, which is associated uh, very strongly with dreaming. Yeah. Just fascinating to see those, those different waves and all that information. Yeah, so I discovered that actually that I dream a lot. I spend about a third, a third of my night is in the REM stage. Wow. And, and um, that is unusual. Uh, for adults, this should be roughly like 20% or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, 30% I, I, is more like I'm a, 
I'm like a two-year-old or something. <laughs> uh, I spent a lot of time <laughs> dreaming. And, uh, and the other interesting thing is it told me that I wake up four to five times a night, even though you sort of don't remember those episodes, mm -hmm. your brain waves uh, show that um, you're, you're awake. And I found that interesting because one question is, why do some people remember their dreams and others don't? And I find that I think it's because of these micro arousals during the night, mm -hmm. uh, becoming, aw becoming awake briefly actually helps me remember my dreams throughout the night. Uh, whereas if I was such a deep sleeper that I, and this technically qualifies as a very good sleeper, mm -hmm. if you don't wake up, then maybe I wouldn't remember as many dreams. Hmm. So it might be good to have a, like a, a minor um, a sleep problem, not, not something really bad, uh, mm -hmm. but something that sort of uh, wakes you up a little bit during the night. And that might help you uh, remember your dreams. Very cool. That was going to be my next question is uh, your dream recall recall is probably much higher than the average person, I would assume. Yeah, I think so. Uh, of course, there are plenty of people who dream like crazy, even mm -hmm. even more. I've, I, you know, there's a there are some Reddit groups on dreams and precognition mm -hmm. and stuff. And you can see that some people are really amazing at, at, at remember their, remembering their dreams. I might be maybe average or above average. And I'm just going to jump into the, the big question here. What interests you in dreams? So the, the main, my main interest is um, the dreams that seem to come true in the future. So uh, you have a dream, and then the next day or a month later or years later, what you saw or heard or experienced in your dream comes true. And you can call that a precognitive dream. Um, or uh, there are other terms. Some people, uh, you've heard of the term deja vu, like yes. previously seen. Mm -hmm. So it's that feeling that something that you see in front of you during uh, waking hours uh, has been previously experienced. And I think some, some deja vu comes uh, from a dream that you've had in the past. Maybe you don't remember the dream specifically, but when the event comes true, you say, Oh, wow, déjà vu. Um, there's actually another French term called déjà rêvé, which means previously dreamed, specifically. So it's, it's not a vague feeling of familiarity. Rather, it's that the, what happened, what just happened in front of you, you remember explicitly as a dream in the past. Um, in my book, I call it... Uh, the oneronaut phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's kind of a funny word. Onero means uh, uh, dream in Greek. Okay. And uh, not or naftis means a uh, traveler. So I put those two things together to create the word oneronauts, which means uh, uh, traveling through time in your dreams. Uh, lucid dreamers also use the phrase, actually, like Ian Wilson. Uh, mm -hmm. He uses it, uh, and what they refer to is becoming conscious of the fact that you're dreaming so that in your dream, you're traveling through it consciously, willfully. Uh, whereas I'm using the word to mean some, some phenomenon in nature is allowing us to occasionally and very briefly experience time travel through our dreams. In his book, Dr. Kalas reviews modern concepts of space and time. From physics and astronomy, he introduced the reader to relativity, gravitational lensing, the particle wave duality of light, quantum entanglement, and biophysics. Now, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I know what any of that means. But it's definitely fascinating, and if you're like me and always up for a challenge, it would at least be fun to try and wrap your head around. Here Dr. Kalas tells us the story about the dream that started everything. It was actually in eighth grade, a um, 13 year old. And in fact, when you look at the, the people who have had precognitive dreams, they often happen for the first time in their lives uh, when they're teens or preteens. Uh, 
Hmm. That's when uh, the age of onset is. And in this dream, it was a very clear dream I, uh, uh, and puzzling. I was dreaming that uh, somebody, another kid, uh, was injured, and somebody asked that kid, how'd you get that injury? And the kid said, jumping from a hay cart to a 16-wheeler. That's the dream. Now, uh, it's funny because uh, a lot of people have like these weird dreams with random phrases. And this was like such a dream. And I, I kept thinking about the dream during the day because you're like, well, what does that mean? Who says that? Have you ever heard that phrase, uh, Mason? Which one? Uh, jumping from a hay cart to a 16-wheeler. I'd never heard of that before. Yeah. So, well, it turns out uh, three months later, I'm in uh, class, in gym class, and a boy walks in and he's injured. Uh, and uh, somebody asks the boy, how'd you get that? And he goes, jumping from a hay cart to a 16-wheeler. I was like, no way. That's not possible. And uh, what's really cool about that type of dream is that that phrase is sort of like a really good, hard to guess password. Mm -hmm. Because it's not, it's not, you know, one, two, three, four. It's not something common. It's extremely novel and creative. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you have some, something that's very hard to anticipate or guess in a dream, and then it comes true in the future, it's sort of like correctly guessing a password that's almost impossible to guess. And so that, that, that's a very convincing type of experience. But at the same time, um, you know, our minds are, are always capable of creating false memories, distorted memories. Uh, we can fool ourselves all the time mm -hmm. about uh, experiences. So I wasn't really sure or positive that this was a case for precognition. Yeah. I mean, after all, if you think about it, having information about events that do not exist uh, is counterintuitive, <laughs> impossible right. as far as our logical reasoning goes. Yeah. Um, and yet, as an astronomer, you know, as a scientist, I find things in nature that have never before been seen. Uh, and some things seem impossible and hard to explain. So the, the key is, even if you don't understand what's happening, and even if it seems impossible, uh, the key is to record your observations mm -hmm. and communicate them faithfully, too. Mm -hmm. Communicate them accurately and without uh, elaboration or distortion yeah. or exaggeration. And so that's, that, that's sort of why I feel uh, that talking about my dreams is a worthy exercise. If I'm wrong that it's precognition, well, I didn't do anything wrong because I'm actually reporting what I know the most faith, in the most faithful and accurate way I can. So you have a dream. And it includes a very specific and unique event, along with an uncommon phrase or a couple of words. It's strange enough in its own right, and to try and make sense of it uh, in and of itself is difficult. I'm always curious as to people's initial reactions and also feelings during and after they wake up from a dream like that. And as we'll hear now, sometimes writing down your dreams can lead to new discoveries. Well, it was a long time ago, um, and uh, those ex these types of experiences are happening all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, on average, uh, about 36 or 37 times a year for me. Hmm. Wow. Um, and the feeling is that of recognition, uh, uh, sort of like the aha moment. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes, I had, I heard that phrase in a dream, or aha, this was from a dream, this thing that I'm looking at right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's that sort of uh, 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 light, the, 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 the light bulb that goes off in your uh, head, like, aha. Something that, finally clicks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Other people, you know, this is a normal experience. Some people actually find it rather frightening. Um, when I'm reading other people's accounts on uh, the Reddit group, uh, Precognition, mm -hmm. some people... Uh, fear it. They they think there might be something wrong with them, mm. uh, or that they can't control it. So there's a definitely a 
variation in what people think about having uh, these experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I enjoy them. I look, I really uh, love to have them and I write them down. So there are two journals. One is the dream journal and the other is a journal of the events that actually come true. Oh. So I describe uh, what happened in waking life uh, and what are sort of the key elements to the precognitive dream or to the experience. Um, like what exactly about the experience was precognitive? And if you think about it, you have to write down a few details. You don't want to be vague about it. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Between writing down details of visions or things you have experienced in your dream life and getting behind a telescope day after day and studying what seems to be a never-ending night sky, what piques your interest and drives you to keep exploring the unknown? Uh, we're very curious. Uh, human beings are very curious. And uh, we always want to know if I use a new technique or if I go to a new place, what will I discover? It's it's action for the sake of curiosity and almost uh, no other reason. Hmm. But as an astronomer, um, one of the most important dreams I had was about a discovery I made uh, in 2004. And that's sort of detailed in my book. But the, the discovery itself was not anticipated or known when I had the dream. I had the dream in 1995. Mm -hmm. The discovery was made in 2004. Um, and even though in science we can anticipate certain things about nature, this discovery was rather unique. It was about a planetary system around a, a star called Fomalhaut, uh, which you can actually see with the naked eye. You don't even need binoculars or anything. Mm -hmm. And this planetary system uh, was a new discovery in 2004. It had it was not known to exist um, in the way I discovered it. And I made the discovery with a Hubble Space Telescope. And I saw essentially uh, around the star a belt of comets. Um, so it sort of looks like an ellipse around a very bright star. Hmm. And the way this ellipse is, um, is presented to us from our vantage point has some very unique features uh, and repeating again, nobody had any idea that this star would have this elliptical belt of comets around it in the way it was discovered. So when I look back at my dream log in 1995, I actually sketched the discovery. I sketched the Hubble Space Telescope image that would become part of my reality and part of human knowledge in 2004. So that it's then that I finally said, whoa, precognitive dreams are not necessarily a problem with memories or coincidence or um, uh, the self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. uh, this was clear evidence uh, that a dream I had in 1995 uh, was precognitive. It matched a discovery that would be made nine years later. Yeah. Didn't you write down the star that, sorry, I don't, I don't know the name, uh, how you described it, but there was a star you wrote down the name and it, the name of the star was wrong, but what you drew was accurate. Yeah, indeed. In fact, this is, that's exactly uh, uh, one of the key reasons. It's very hard to make a prediction from your precognitive dreams. Mm. Um, and if you think about it, if you're really thinking critically, somebody can say, well, if I'm so good at precognitive dreams, how come I'm not predicting the stock market or winning the lottery mm -hmm. or preventing plane crashes? And the problem is uh, dreams, when you're dreaming, uh, there's a mix of elements. Some of your dreams are about your past, about issues you're trying to resolve, problems you're trying to solve. Uh, and at the same time, you're getting like five to 10 seconds of information from the future about things that haven't happened. So when you assign meaning or context to something from the future, your library of information is just the library of things that you know in the present, right? So 
I mean, let's take uh, an example, an easier example of a face. Let's say in a dream that's about the future, uh, you see a face. Mm -hmm. Now, how are you going to assign a name to a face? You have a library. Every one of us sort of has a cognitive library of people we know, what they look like, and what they're called. Mm -hmm. uh, but all of a sudden, you see a face from the future. Now, if that face resembles somebody you actually know, uh, you might say, hey, I had a dream about uh, John. Mm -hmm. And you describe the dream about John. But in fact, you've made a mistake because the face you saw is actually um, a person from your future who resembles John. Hmm. And so that, that I'm now circling back to your original question. Yeah. When I wrote down my dream in 1995, I sketched what I saw, but really my library of information could only depend on my present and past. Right. So when I wrote down my dream, I wrote down the name of a star that I was studying at the time, mm -hmm. um, but it was the wrong name. Mm. And, and that's why that dream, for example, didn't really help me make the discovery. I mean, if the, if the dream said, oh, look, use the Hubble Space Telescope and point your telescope and here are the coordinates and here's the name of the star. Well, then I would be using precognitive dreams to make amazing discoveries all the time. <laughs> but in fact... The, the, these dreams are really part of this, uh, this uh, whole sort of jungle of thoughts and emotions that get tangled with the actual precognitive information. Um, have, you, have you heard of people um, making dream maps or like, like a bird's eye view of their dreamscape? Um, have you ever done that yourself or heard of other people doing that? Maps? Um, well, no, I, I uh, don't know much about that. Uh, Ian Wilson says in his Lucid Dreaming, he tries to explore the space consciously that the dream is presenting to him. Hmm. I'm not a lucid dreamer, though, so I'm not doing it on purpose yeah. to map on the space. Yeah. Have you ever experienced a lucid dream? Oh, not as I'm not as uh, good as the lucid dreamers. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I can say that I may at times be aware that I'm dreaming, but lucid dreamers are not only aware, they start controlling what they're mm. doing. In their mm -hmm. dreams. Uh, I'm not doing that, really. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't experienced that either. It sounds amazing, though. Um, one can only try. Um, I, I do have a question. Um, if you were to, usually this is for p people that have experienced lucid dreams. Um, the question is, if you were able to spend 24 hours in the dream life with anybody of your choice, um, what would you do and why? Oh, <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Um, living or dead? Uh, Does, that... Either one. Yep. Uh, like let's say it's uh, someone that's already passed. You can bring them back and hang out with them for a day. Ah, well, you know, I, I'm sort of, uh, if you, you might expect that since I'm a scientist, I'd, I'd probably want to hang out with Einstein, right? That's fair. <laughs> and have a chat with him because I'd like to, I, I would actually want to find out what his views are on uh, my subject matter. If you think about precognitive dreams, this actually calls into question our perception of space and time. Yeah. How can you, I mean, quite literally, how can you be in bed and at the same time, you're awake in the future doing something. Where are you exactly? Mm -hmm. Where are you? Are you yeah. at both places at once? Is it just the information that is going from the future to the past? Uh, so with somebody like Einstein, you could actually talk about the fabric of reality. Um, and, and another thing is I've realized is that a lot of scientists don't talk about these experiences mm -hmm. because um, they can be damaging to their reputation. But when you talk privately to them, mm -hmm. I would say that one out of three that I've talked to privately will really resonate with the uh, things that, I, that are in my book, like precognitive mm -hmm. dreams. Sometimes they haven't had precognitive dreams per se, but they might have other beliefs that they will not talk about publicly. Yeah. 
can you speak on um, any anything that you know, like how long we spend in the REM state since you, you've tracked it a little bit, but do you know how long, like, so say we're in um, deep REM sleep for, you know, 10, 15 minutes, but our dream can seem like eight hours doing whatever we were doing in the dream. Yeah, uh, those are, that's a great question. Actually, I think that kind of question really uh, hits at sort of the forefront of research. Um, and so you might not even get an answer if you, you asked a neuroscientist or a dream specialist like uh, Matt Walker, who's a psychology mm-hmm. professor at the University of California where I work. Um, so uh, I think that that kind of thing needs to be uh, measured, and I think it can be done uh, more accurately in the future. So what people, what neuroscientists can do now is they can uh, use uh, fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, which tracks your blood flow in your brain and basically says what parts of your brain are using fuel or not. Hmm. Uh, So you sort of start making a pattern of all, the brain is such a complicated uh, piece of tissue with some 200 million neurons, uh, but you can see which of those neurons are active um, as you experience life. So for example, when you're awake, uh, let's say you're looking at a car, you're, the brain activity that you have will have a certain pattern. And then when you shift your gaze and look at a person, it'll have a different pattern. Hmm. So a neurologist can actually just measure your brain activity and say, uh, without you saying anything, or you could be, even be in another state or another country, the the neurologist could say, "Hey, at this moment, Mason, you're looking at a person," <laughs> because I I can actually they can actually tell from your brain activity, wow. uh, or they'll say, "No, you're not looking at a person. You're actually looking at a car." Hmm. So uh, this is very interesting technology. Of course, this is all about um, uh, sort of machine learning and artificial intelligence and interpreting these brain activity patterns, but. Uh, It turns out when you're sleeping and when you're dreaming, you still have the same brain activity patterns as when you're awake. So if you're dreaming that you're looking at a car and they've got you hooked up to the fMRI, Mm -hmm. the neurologist can say, Mason is dreaming about a car right now. Wow. And and then... uh, Let's say later in the dream, you're you're dreaming about a person. Uh, they'll say, hey, you're dreaming about a person. Not only that, they can even distinguish if you're dreaming uh, about a man or a woman, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, they may not get a clear picture of exactly the face, for example. Yeah. But maybe in the future that will be possible. So I think to answer your question, mm-hmm. in the future, when, when uh, people are... are they may ask the question, you know, what's going on during REM sleep? How much of that is actually dreaming? And they can say, well, your dream that you just had uh, about a car and a person lasted 10 seconds. And, but from your perspective, you might think, wow, that didn't last 10 seconds. That felt like an hour. Yeah. So they can actually quantify it rather than guess. That's, that's amazing. Um, is anybody recording that, that those patterns? Yeah, yeah. Right? This is uh, very, this is uh, uh, very interesting. So you sort of have to create a library. You have to mm-hmm. train. You have to understand how the person responds to different stimuli. Mm-hmm. So while you're awake, they'll show you a car and they'll record what your brain pattern is like. Mm-hmm. And then when you see a person, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you make a library of ba- brain patterns that correspond to images. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that's how the technique works. Uh, the first I heard of it was uh, around 2013. So it's relatively new. Wow. What are you excited about right now as far as research being done? Um, or um, what are some of your personal, personal goals uh, for the future? Well, it seems to me like uh, we're not taking advantage of uh, precognitive dreams. I mean, people describe uh, precognitive dreams anecdotally as an interesting story. They might post their story on Reddit or YouTube. But can't we 
isn't it possible to make this useful for us or as individuals or for society? Um, so, for example, in one of your podcasts, um, I've, one of your uh, speakers, his father died in a plane crash mm -hmm. in 1979. And there was a gentleman who actually had precognitive dreams about the plane crash and kept calling the airport and the airlines, American Airlines, to warn them that a crash was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And apparently, um, the airline took it seriously. The FAA actually took it seriously enough that they, they talked to him. But there was nothing they could do because the information was kind of vague. I mean, yeah. at any given time, like at this instant, there may be 5,000 planes over the United States in the air. Right. Um, so which one of those 5,000 at this moment might crash and, you know, over the course of a day, how many more thousands of flights are we talking about? So what was needed back in 1979 to save those, uh, poor people on the plane was another precognitive dreamer, not just one person giving information. What would have happened if you had a system, for example, of, 10,000 people who are contributing their dreams and um, sophisticated algorithms are parsing through all the data in those dreams and understanding which dreams are about personal conflicts and past memories and which of those, uh, the, which other dreams are possibly about a future event. Hmm. And once you'd identify those possible dreams, which of those dreams are about a possible plane crash? And slowly using a large quantity of information from 10,000 people instead of just a single person to localize what that future event would be. Um, I think it would be possible if you had such a system to actually have a pretty good guess on what day that uh, plane was going to crash uh, in what city, uh, and then after that, you can take action. Right. You can actually take action before the event happens, and you can actually change the course of history. You can create a new timeline for Earth's history mm -hmm. by manipulating time, the events in time. And I call that engineering time. Humanity now, and up to this point, became good at engineering space or objects, matter. Mm -hmm. I think that in the future, uh, and we're talking about maybe uh, from 500 years to 5,000 years from now, mm -hmm. uh, humans will be capable of actually manipulating our timelines, hmm. optimizing them essentially. Of course, this but this creates all sorts of questions, like yeah. who's in charge? Uh, yeah. Do we give up the, our privacy uh, for the benefits of this kind of system? Um, so, for example, uh, listeners may say, may, may contemplate the following question: If you would you allow your dreams to be recorded by someone else every day, even though you know how private dreams can be? Yeah. But would you allow that to happen if there is a chance that the information could save your life in the future? Or not only your life, we dream about other people's problems too. So yeah. you could imagine what a family, would a family participate in uh, such a system of recording dreams if that, for example, could uh, give valuable information for the family in the future? And it, could, it doesn't have to be something as dire as like dying in a car accident right. or right. cancer. It could be like, well, what, uh, what job, what career choice is best for you? Mm -hmm. Or are you going to meet someone in the future that is the right match for you? Or is that person a disaster? <laughs> that, <laughs> right? Yeah. So you can imagine actually dating services uh, based on this uh, type of dream analysis. Uh, so not, unfortunately, probably not getting to the level of predicting a flight, but I, I bet the first uses of such uh, technology might be just for uh, dating. 
it's just going to take a, a lot of people uh, and everybody's uh, cooperation in order to get something um, on that level. Yeah, but I think it's um, we're heading in that direction. I think it's inevitable. I mean, look at all the information we're sharing online. Uh, our photo, for example, when you're talking about uh, dreaming about a face, there are databases now where just think of your, about your driver's license or passport photo. Yeah, yeah. The, the facial recognition software knows what you look like. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe no single individual really is studying you, but uh, a, a, a sophisticated computer system would be able to match your face to, um, to some other image of your face. So imagine, for example, remember I talked about dreaming about a person's face? Mm -hmm. Imagine that the, the recording becomes so sophisticated that when you dream about a face, the, the neuroscientist has an estimate of the face that you just saw in your dream. And then facial recognition software out of this database, out of the a database of a billion people yeah. tells you who you dreamt about. Now, the, the nice thing is it could tell you that the person you dreamt about was somebody from your past because hmm. it, knows, it knows your past. Yeah. You've got your whole biography online somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, or it could tell you this person is not from your past. It's, that person is not even from 100 miles around from where you live. This person actually lives in a foreign country. And you might be told that you're going to meet this person in your future. <laughs> this, is such right? a cool, this is such a cool idea. Yeah. 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 It's amazing. Um, I think we're going to be kind of wrapping it up. Uh, I, I'm sure we could talk for hours. Um, <laughs> again, it was just an honor talking with you. Um, I really appreciate your time. And um, yeah, thanks again. Yeah, Mason, I love your project. Good job. I hope you find uh, many more uh, dreamers to, to talk with. Thank you very much, Paul. Great. Take care. All right, folks, that's going to do it for episode 13, the last episode of the year. So how do you feel about giving up some of your privacy in order to form a database of information from our dreams? If it could possibly lead to new discoveries or help people in the future, why or why not? And again, if recording your dreams sounds like something you'd like to do, uh, the best way to do it is to record a video and put it online somewhere. That way it's time stamped and it cannot be easily manipulated at a later date. Try and add as much detail as possible without exaggerating your story. And lastly, how do we get more people talking about their experiences? And as Paul said, some scientists choose not to speak about their precognitive dreams and fears of damaging their reputation. Nobody is required to do anything they don't want to, but how are we supposed to make progress? I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I want to thank you again for all your support. Please like, share, and subscribe, and if you have a story you think you'd like to share, Please reach out and contact us through our website or also contact me through allaboardthedreamtrain at gmail.com. I wish everybody many dreams in 2020. Get some sleep and we'll see you next year.